extremely honored to welcome you all on behalf of the citizens and the Diaspora Directorate, the ECOSOC, and ECOSOC Mauritius. Thank you, Excellency, for accepting our invitation. Allow me also to thank Mr. Dennis Cody, Presiding Officer of ECOSOC, for accepting our invitation to grace this event. Mr. Cody, you are the first Presiding Officer of ECOSOC to visit our country, and we feel privileged to have you here. The Republic of Mauritius warmly welcomes you. Ladies and gentlemen, ECOSOC was established against a backdrop of unstructured relationships between member states and civil society in the development processes. The objective are to contribute to the integration and inclusive development of the continent, provide a platform through which the AU will partner and engage with civil society organizations on the continent, and facilitate effective interface between member states and their peoples through partnership and engagement with African CSOs. I would like to mention that ECOSOC is not a watchdog organization. We are not here to fight government. It is the African non-state actors audience. ECOSOC is designed to give CSOs a voice within the AU institutions and decision-making processes. As per our mandate, we are required to work in partnership and with member states. One of the key mandates of ECOSOC is to popularize and domesticate Agenda 2063 of the African Union by building citizens' awareness and mobilizing national stakeholders, including government, private sector, NGOs, CSOs, as well as women and youth. Agenda 2063 is a strategic framework for the social economic transformation of the continent over the next 50 years. It builds on and seeks to accelerate, accelerate the implementation of past and existing continental initiatives for growth and sustainable development. At the extraordinary summit of the Assembly of African Union held on 21st March 2018 in Kigali, the heads of state and government launched the African Continental Free Trade Area. The AFCFTA is one of the flagship programs of AU Agenda 2063. Today's workshop will revolve exclusively around the AFCFTA, so I will not be elaborating on say uh, and so on. Allow me to present a brief history of ECOSOC in Mauritius. Back in 2007, the Mauritius Council of Social Service, MACOS, under the leadership of Mr. Paramasiva Chengan, started countrywide consultations with civil society organizations and present the Economic, Social and Cultural Council, which itself was established by the Assembly of Head of State and Government. 2004, sorry. ECOSOC caters for two elected civil society organizations at national level for each of its 55 member states. In 2008, Marcos and Serge de Damori created the first permanent general assembly of ECOSOC. In 2014, Antras and Marcos were elected into the second permanent general assembly and in 2018, Antras and Ali Movement were elected into the third permanent general assembly. The Africa Union of Architects, AUA, was also elected at the third permanent general assembly as a continental organization which is based in Mauritius. Ladies and gentlemen, at times it is important to recall and to express gratitude as well. The Republic of Mauritius can boast itself of two of its sons, who happen to be biological <laughs> brothers as well. Dr. Raj Tintaram was the first Mauritian to form the Standing Committee of ECOSOC. He was elected for two successive mandates as Chair of Infrastructure and Energy and served as capacity 
in capacity as expert for Region 1963, and also spearheading the establishment of national chapters in EU member states. Thank you, Raj, for your contribution and dedication. Allow me also to thank and congratulate the chair and convener of this workshop, Mr. Vinesh Chindao. As a member of the Working Group on Trade and Industry, Vinesh championed the idea to host a workshop on the AFCFTA back in 2019. A project which was presented to the East because of Secretariat, but given the strict AU financial rules, the Secretariat could not allocate resources to hold this event just after the AU summit. But in spite of this, Vinesh and his team, Vision Network Africa, and his colleague at Visual Team, team up to organize this event with their own resources. So as incoming chapter chair, I feel obliged and grateful to the team which has been toiling to make this happen today. On 25th May 1963, 32 independent African states signed the founding charter of the Organization for African Unity, the OAU, in Addis Ababa. We have come a long way. We are nearly 57 years into the journey and it is truly inspiring to be an African citizen. Africa is gradually turning a new page, and now we can look into the future with great optimism. Our vision is to create Africa desired by Africans. Let's do it, Africa. Asante San. I would like to thank Vision Network Africa for inviting me at this forum. We are all very familiar to the African problem. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I truly believe in this wisdom. However, today, our continent is at crossroads, where we need to step change and ask ourselves, how do we infuse a new dynamism to the pace and scale of development of an integrated Africa? In that spirit and determination, our leaders of the continent decided to have a synergistic approach to shape a better future for Africa. In 2018, 44 countries joined hands and adhered to the framework for creating a borderless Africa. Today, two years after this landmark agreement was signed in Kigali, we now have 54 countries making up the world's largest free trade area. This flagship project aims to deepen regional integration and boost economic cooperation among member states to foster inclusive growth and above all, unleash the potential of the continent. The African CFTA commits countries to remove tariffs on 90% of goods. Progressively, liberalize trade services and address a host of non-tariff barriers, including the protocol on free movement of people, right to residence and right to establishment, and the single African air transport market. Ladies and gentlemen, in full of Africa is full of promise and untapped riches from oil and minerals and to vast amount of arable land. The continent is home to an abundance of natural resources that include diamond, gold, oil, natural gas, uranium, platinum, copper, cobalt, iron, bauxite, silver, and more. In fact, it has approximately 30% of the Earth's remaining mineral resources and boasts nearly 60% of the world's available arable land. Yet, Africa's economic takeoff remains unstable and the continent remains fragmented. This is evident looking at cross-border trade among African member countries. <coughs> Intracontinental trade makes up only 17% of the 
total value of African trade, which is substantially lower than the equivalent for most other regional blocks such as Asia and European Union, which stand at nearly 60%. Despite increasing interconnectedness for district regional blocks across Africa, this has not brought the desired outcome. For instance, trade deficit in Comesa was at approximately 70 billion USD last year. Between 1990 and 2014, while most fast-growing countries in the world diversified their economies, most African countries increased their dependence on the extracted, extractive industries and export of commodities, mainly unprocessed commodities. It is time for Africa to change and to believe in the potential of its people. It is particularly important that African states tap on the wealth of resources and build the value change. Producing high-end quality products will unlock new market access and foster export diversification that will ultimately build resilience to movements in demand due to global economic downturns. Ladies and gentlemen, we are hopeful that the implementation of the CFTA will trigger a new economic impetus for the region. It will create a single African market of over a billion consumers with a total GDP of 3 trillion USD. The African Union Commission estimates that the CFTA, coupled with other complementary trade facilitation measures, that will boost the speed and reduce the cost of customs procedures and port handling, will increase the share of intra-African trade to 22% of the total trade by 2022. Besides, establishing a borderless Africa is, expect, is expected to boost Africa's GDP by 1% and total employment by 1.2%. It is clear that the trade potential would be unlocked once the CFTA is implemented and would offer African countries considerable benefits. This continental agreement will be a game changer for stimulating intra-African trade and likewise, this will harness new opportunities for Mauritius. Mauritius is fully committed to embrace this continental agreement and be part of the new journey. The elimination of new tariff barriers, harmonization of trade laws, and standardization of process will be beneficial for Mauritian exports, leveraging the inherent potential of the CFTA. Mauritian products will derive a competitive advantage and access a more diversified African market. This will indeed boost Mauritian exports to Africa, which is currently accounting for 23% of our total annual exports. Besides, Mauritius will play a more important role in the region and consolidate its position as a trade corridor between Asia and Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Mauritius is experiencing a negative balance of trade and with the headwind of change on the global market in the wake of the numerous challenges such as trade liberalization, Brexit, and more recently, the outbreak of the coronavirus, the implementation of the CFTA will undeniably unleash new trade opportunities for Mauritius. We are confident that having a more integrated African market through the CFTA will bring about intrinsic economic benefits to our country. Ladies and gentlemen, as the chairman of the EDB, I am privileged to apprise you of the efforts being undertaken by the EDB to infuse a new dynamism in the pace and scale of development of an integrated Africa. First, the EDB will be working towards the setting up 
of a regional cabotage network to improve connectivity and intra-regional trade. Second, the EDB, along with the regional ministries and agencies, will work to set up a regional import substitution strategy and developing manufacturing centers of excellence. I am also delighted to convey that the EDB will actively participate at the upcoming workshop in Addis Ababa and work towards the drafting of the investment protocol of the AFCFTA. Ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to live on a young and dynamic continent of 1.3 billion people, bringing with resources of all kinds. And now that we have united and committed our collective energy through the landmark AFCFTA, our aim is to embrace the challenges on our way and see to it that the treaty becomes a reality that will transform the lives of millions of people and induce prosperity for all the continent. Indeed, I am, I am confident that we will achieve success together. I commend this learnable initiative and hope that the CFTA at full potential will herald a new dawn for African states and will be a crucial driver for economic growth, industrialization, and a sustainable development of the African continent. Thank you. When I had a chance to discuss also with ADP, it was something that was challenging to me because sometimes when you have forums like this, we don't hear plans that member countries have to support initiatives that has already been put up uh, with our leaders when they meet at our level. And uh, I was quite impressed that they have certain areas that can be very useful in informing our leadership in terms of areas to look at how this is going to help. As you all know, Africa has quite a number of challenges, but also Africa has a number of resources that we can take advantage of. And we are just discussing with one of my colleagues here who is in the mining industry. And if we can trade within ourselves, then it will be very important for us not to use to allow other people to misuse our resources in terms of exporting it to other countries. But this can be beneficial to our own, our own development. And I think this initiative, SPF, is very important. And I think it was very important for our leaders to look at it, to create something like this that will, will, will promote good relationship, will enable us to understand each other the potentials in various member countries in terms of building our economies. So you actually, this is really something that we really appreciate and something that we look forward to. And I take this opportunity to thank you more uh, profusely for taking time to be with us, to share with us, and to have this, this platform so that we can continue to enrich this discussion, we can continue to, uh, to advance our thoughts in terms of how best we want it to go. Uh, in conclusion, uh, ECOSOC will be working very closely with various governments on various activities as well. And uh, we would like to encourage our members who are here. I know our colleagues here from the civil society. The definition of civil society in the status of ECOSOC is not just CSO. Our definition is that with non-stakeholders working within, within various member countries, whether it is uh, the private sector, the media, the NGOs, the CSOs, the professional uh, associations and, uh, and organizations are members of ECOSOC. And therefore, we have a very wide constituency in terms of executing various activities that we need to help our countries. We need to help the continent to develop. And I, as the presiding officer, I look forward to advancing this further. I look forward to emulating what I've seen in Mauritius, uh, what the organizers have done, so that we can continue to replicate this. I'm happy that the government of Kenya has sent an initiative here. We have a chapter in Kenya, which have been founded here. But now with my elevation, there's other leadership who are running it. We want probably the next meeting, if it's possible, my brother, Mr. Frederick uh, Marwanga, to see whether we can hold the next meeting, this kind of possibility meeting in Nairobi, where we can continue to expand this discussion, and then we can continue to help our leaders in pushing this kind of agenda for our own good. With those uh, many remarks, Your Excellency, again, I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for this, my brother Vinesh, uh, Dr. Raj, uh, the, the genetic of, uh, of
of Mauritius in the General Assembly and also the chairman of the Mauritius National Chapter for this kind of initiative, initiation. We are, we are going to share this kind of information widely for other members from other different countries to see and also to learn from what we have done. And I believe this is the beginning of a long journey. The Chinese said the long journey starts with one step. I think we have already made a step, so it's no longer long. But let's see how we can push for it further and make it a reality and support Africa to advance in development. Thank you so much.
cup in good and inclusive governance remain. And climate change, as well as state fragility, threaten to reverse the hard core for gains of recent decay. Progress in implementing SDGs has been uneven both across countries and across worlds, often either by the lack of coordination across nations and local government, as well as the global system at large. Financing continues to be the biggest inroads to global success. Resources for mobilization strategies that can push Africa over the finish line have to be explored. With rapid population growth and urbanization, African leaders must fashion and implement policies that encourage job creation and maintain the delivery. Strategies have to be devised for government to invest in sectors prime to grow and create jobs, prepare young people for the jobs of the future, and improve the quality of living in Africa's rapidly growing cities. Overshadowing all these challenges is the threat of climate change. Food security is particularly in the crossline as climate change threatens means of production and the nutrition of the continent's people. Many leaders see the fourth industrial revolution and its accompanying technologies as a pathway for main solution to the challenges facing the continent. Progress to our goals such as education access, climate change mitigation, and service delivery can be enhanced by digital tools, both already available and on the horizon. Artificial intelligence can, hand in hand, with enabling and empowering policies, improve business, healthcare, and the livelihoods of all. Ladies and gentlemen, bolstered by the newly implemented Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, policies to encourage innovation and integration can propel the continent into new frontiers of business <coughs> and human development. For Africa to realize the full potential of the AFC FDA, it will have to put in place policies that encourage research and development and protect innovation by both resident and non-resident alike but with a sharp focus on domestic innovation due to its young, dynamic, and increasingly educated population. Furthermore, new technology platforms are developing across the continent. In 2018, Africa's service sector accounted for over 52% of Africa's GDP, largely boosted by the growing digital sector. These technologies are empowering new small and major entrepreneurs, creating jobs, diversifying economies, improving productivity, and facilitating entry into the market. The AFC FTA can provide the vehicle for going to scale for a full Africa market, while ensuring that these innovations are adequately protected, a move that requires innovation legislation to be standardized across markets. To make the most of intra-African trade, patents and technology we would have to accelerate research and development in universities. Furthermore, we need to support innovation, education, especially higher education for both boys and girls relating to science and the fourth industrial relations oriented subject. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing would stop the ANC FTA from becoming a reality. With the economic integration of the continent's 54 countries, this would mean a market of over 1.3 billion people and a combined GDP of more than 6 trillion US dollars. Mauritius has long been an advocate for developing economic bridges between itself and other African states, leveraging its position as one of the Africa's best place to conduct business. Being relatively small, as I said before, and manageable, we have been able in the past 50 years to 
to enter into meaningful, meaningful treaties with Asia and Europe for the benefit of users within Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, AIC, FTA, we all its advantages for the continent as they can put start for a successful implementation. There will be, of course, some hurdles along the way, but together we can always find solutions. In this connection, we must recognize the contribution of ECOSOC, which has an important role to play in the effective translation of the objectives, principles and policies into concrete programs. Yes, we can. Before concluding, I would like to express my appreciation that this workshop will focus on three areas which are important, I may even say sine qua non, for unlocking the potentials of the African continent through free trade agreement. I now have a great pleasure and honor to declare the workshop open, wishing you success in your discussions and deliberations. Thank you. The credit, of course, goes to Finesh uh, and his team. When he kick started, Finesh wanted through me to thank everyone who have contributed to bring Mauritius to the present state. As I have been an active agent in the national building exercise during my career in the public sector, I am also happy to be among this audience of participants, all my friends, I hope, who have shared their time, apprehensions, desire to forge ahead in their respective fields. We have facilitated and acted sometimes promptly and sometimes less. We have been actively always involved in economic integration and boosting the continent's industrialization. We have been signing many agreements multilateral with Africa as well as bilateral with sub-Saharan countries. We have provided platforms for political, financial, economic, diplomatic, dispute set and dispute settlements. We have offered our privileges accorded to us by other Asian and European countries. We have also been the linchpin to obtain benefits from AGOA in matters relating to the production of goods and services. All the while in the nation building process, we have set up the necessary structures locally to be more proactive in our in our collaboration with other African countries in order to encourage cross-border trade and investments. The landmarks that have enabled the developments are inter area diversification of the economy from monocrop to industrialization, taking the opportunity of Hong Kong to now know how and re-engineering our tax system to give the required fiscal incentives. We have reorganized our indirect taxes by lowering customs, duties, etc. This has been a daring and long and laborious process. We have created institutional frameworks such as the MRA to maximize revenue collection and fight against corruption. We have created the free port with special tax regime to facilitate and boost the trade. We have set up stock exchange for financial markets development. We have created the offshore financial institution framework. And we have made possible and advantageous for local banks to operate outside Malaysia. We have created special economic zones in friendly countries in sub-Saharan Africa. I always say joking to my friends, 
that China has taken five days to be the hospital of 1,000 beds. And we are taking 15 years and more to collaborate collectively with Africa to create win-win situations in terms of trade, exchange of goods and services, investments and improvements for our brethren. This agreement, I, I am sure, will be a powerful tool in the di that direction, the more so that the present initiative will give rise to recommendations to be presented to the EU for prompt implementation. I shall be available to share anecdotes on the nation building episodes in the corridor. I thank you, Vinesh, for this invita invitation to go down memory lane, and I wish to express my uh, satisfaction that this uh, workshop is going to go a long way to create another momentum for the development of economic ties between countries of sub-Saharan Africa. What do you want it in French? Don't worry, say no. I was just putting this across so that you may realize that this is part of the challenges. We have several languages, although English is the main one. We have different sensitivities and the impact of going across the borders and making one African market has to go from this place. So we need to bridge the gap. And we choose to bridge the gap instead of just thinking of the negative impact. So we call it our common challenges. It's the state of mind. This is where the difference is. They won't change by themselves. We need to keep on at it. So, as Vinesh was saying, we are silencing the girls. And that is really what we want to be able to go further. It's funny, isn't it, that these two heads put together can also make a heart. But sometimes we don't see. Yet, the subliminal signals are there. We are already moving towards each other in a learning way. Because funnily enough, everything is about love. It can be love of money, love of profit, and many other forms of love. So how do we bridge the gaps? We were saying it's a matter of state of mind in dignities. So instead of looking what the dissimilarities are, we consider dissimilarities as qualities that can enhance our daily life, our appreciation of life. So you have one side, number one, Another side, number two, and you have to bridge this gap. Instead of trying to fight, instead of trying to dominate the other, we have to start thinking of an integral system whereby people can benefit on all sides, what we call a win-win situation. And this is the third way. For that, we need to pitch a bit. 
on all sides. We can't expect to win it all. That is essential if we want this to succeed. We have so many countries coming together, so many different ways, so many different agendas. So, we need some specific values to have for bridging the gaps. Respect. Respect of the difference, acceptance of the dissimilarities, trust is essential. It doesn't mean that you've got to give it all, of course. It needs to be a win-win situation, but with it, a minimum of trust. The sort of trust that is in conscious, it's like when you have a matchbox, uh, you do believe that you're going to produce some form of fire with it. It's not written anywhere. You're just going to brush it on and the fire will come. So we need this minimum trust. It needs to be really there. And we need to be conscious of it, because if we're not conscious of it, we sort of gradually move away from it and we start to see the other one as an enemy instead of being a friend, a brother. Can we go back to communication? So communication. In that word you have several things. You have communion and you have action. This needs to be constant. If I'm not quite sure why you're looking at me like that um, and I start to figure out that you, you want to uh, kill me, hit me, or whatever, that starts to be a problem. So I have to ask you, you need to be frank, direct. What is it really that is creating a block? So from there, we start to collaborate to build something new together, something successful together. So, opportunities today can only happen if we are determined to learn and work together to bridge the gap. Learn together. Learning is essential. Every one of us has a genius. And we need to learn together how to develop this genius, how to share this ability. And this is by doing such a thing that we are eager to appreciate each other's way. That is essential. Respect, trust, communication, collaboration. And you see the happiness. And the future. The future leaders. Girls. Boys. This is where we must not forget to invest. Because they are the people that will deal with this impact, full blast. We're just opening the ways, but they will leave it, really. So we need to equip them with the proper tools to deal with this impact. I hope that all of you do remember that and see what in your own business you can always include so that the future generation can really live what we want to achieve today. I hope you got the message. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Very pleased to be in your midst uh, this morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important forum. Uh, I've been asked yesterday to deliver a speech on uh, uh, opening the sky of Africa. Uh, so I'll try my best to, to share with you my experience with regard to uh, travel and tourism and the opening of our airspace. space. Rapidly, um, it all started in November 1988 with, uh, with the Yamasu Crow Declaration, way back in 88, where we decided, the African countries all together decided, that there should be a full liberalization of inter-African air transport services. That was in 1988. Later on, a few years later, in Mauritius here itself, there was the 
declaration from Mauritius that there was a need to accelerate uh, the process of uh, the for the implementation of the Yang Zucro Declaration. January 2018, in Addis Ababa, a single African air transport market was launched that was considered as a major, uh, a major project in the uh, African Union's agenda uh, for, for, the, for, for the countries, the, the agent in the agenda 2063. What is that? The single African air transport market is meant to serve as an instrument to enhance co connectivity across the African continent, leading to sustainable development of, the, of aviation, tourism, trade, and thereby stimulating economic growth, job creation, prosperity, and integration of Africa. Let us look at the realities, ladies and gentlemen. 1.2 billion people, collective GDP of 2 trillion US dollars, vast expanse of land, mainly landlocked countries, lack of infrastructure, lack of safety and security. These are all the realities, all the perceptions of Africa. Lack of air, sea, and fiber connectivity, absence of proper charlie. 32% of intra Africa travels is made by a non African pubs having to transit either in Europe or in the Middle East. Tourist arrivals in Africa is forecast to increase from 85 million, which we are expecting this year, 85 million out of nearly uh, 1.4 billion tourists across the world. 1.4 billion tourists across the world. Africa, we are expecting this year 85 million. And this is set to, to increase to 134 million in the next 10 years. All right, opening the sky is fun. Clearing the sky, getting to an open sky policy for Africa, that's fine. But, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we have to navigate through hard times. Epidemics, pandemics, this is what's going to find on our way to the open sky. Natural disasters, poverty, corruption, instability, social unrest armed conflicts, terrorism, pollution, global warming, climate change, and the This is our world today. Not only in Africa, we are confronting all these uh, problems uh, in various countries. The question is, how prepared are we? The level of preparedness, our level of resilience, would be determinant uh, in the way forward. And what are the challenges of African aviation altogether? Our Africa airspace is fragmented, very fragmented. Protectionist policies not yielding the uh, brilliant results so far. Many governments have been adopting protectionist measures for their own national carriers. What are the results? What are the state of their government right now? How the protectionist measures help them. Statement airline companies versus private airline companies. A big question for Africa. Political interferences, cost of air travel and freight services, taxes by government, capacity building. We have seen by experience attempts to resurrect aiding national carriers in Africa finally may not be advised option. We are not succeeding. Look at air shells. Look at South African Airways. Brilliant companies in the not too distant future uh, past. Many of these. But look at Ethiopian Airlines these days. The pride of Africa, I would say. We have to build partnership. We have to build consortiums. We have to enhance the value chain in Africa, ladies and gentlemen. It's very important. A single African sky for free trade, not if land transportation remains as poor as it is. We may perhaps open the sky, but opening the sky will not give us the desired results. It has to be accompanied with corresponding 
uh, improvements in land transportation, improvement in airport management. Corrupt business practices cannot be a way of life. Opening the sky will not help. National carriers should not be made to dance to the tune of the big, what I call, the emperors of the sky. They are very good. Helping us to collapse. We have seen many, many examples. Air Lanka, they get the, uh, people, companies, big carriers coming to help them, but helping them to collapse until they were swallowed by those companies, by those big carriers. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you that our airspace, be it for individual countries, but for the whole continent, that's a national wealth. This is a continental wealth. We have to look at the role and the importance of low-cost carriers in Africa. The question is, if low-cost carriers are doing so well in Europe, low-cost carriers are doing so well in the United States, low-cost carriers are doing so well in Asia, Singapore Airlines has got four low-cost carriers as subsidiaries. Emirates Airlines has got five Dubai, which is a low-cost. There are so many low-cost carriers in developing, highly developed countries. The question is, why is it that Africa cannot have low-cost carriers, given the disposable income of our people? Why is it that it doesn't work really? We have a few, but it doesn't work as it is elsewhere. So we have to, in terms of developing the airspace, opening the airspace, we also have to look at travel and trade facilitation. Improve on that score. Customs, visa, formalities, health, freight services, currency exchanges, e-services. But also building a new continental air, airspace architecture for Africa. That is having to do with policy organization, regulatory framework, incentive schemes for development. It will not open by itself. You will not attract people to open it for you. Ownership and control, competition, taxation, consumer protection. Somebody said it earlier in some of the speeches. Time is not a sense. Time for positive and meaning, meaningful actions. Time for Africa to move. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe strongly that there is a rising of Africa. The whole world recognizes the importance, the essence of Africa. Time for us to industrialize and digitalize also Africa. Opening the space doesn't mean much if it is not accompanied by concrete measures for the development of Africa, for the eradication of poverty in Africa, reduction at least of poverty in Africa. So industrializing and digitalizing Africa should be high on the agenda. And Mauritius, we also can be part of that. Building a new trade bridge between the emerging economies and Africa. We are geostrategically well positioned to play this role in the whole area here. Mauritius for Africa reminds me of the Dragon Mart model where China has built a city in Dubai and it's doing so well. The whole of the region, Middle East region, even the world, I lived in Dubai for so many years and I can tell you the Dragon Mart is worth a model that we can develop for Africa. Mauritius can be the vitrine uh, of uh, lots of products that we can sell to Africa and Africa selling their products here. Opportunities, that's the theme that I was given yesterday. I strongly believe that there is a global shift in the balance of power. <coughs> Worldwide, there is a change happening. The, the wealth of countries are moving. It's no more Europe. Europe is aging. Asia is taking shape, bigger shape in the world economy, in the destiny of the world economy. Globalization of trade, travel and tourism, not only globalization of the economy, travel and tourism is globalizing. People are not only traveling from north to south. Tourism is booming from all parts of the world, from across the planet. Shifting our market frontiers. <coughs> With Cape Point, market frontiers are moving. Connected consumers, we are all connected. We can buy paintings from our bedroom from anywhere in the world today. We can buy anything worth more on the net. Shopping is being reinvented. Importance of artificial intelligence and blockchain to free trade and passenger traffic. 
big change can happen towards a new aviation landscape in Africa. It's going to happen. Things are moving. The marshes sans frontier. This is a reality nowadays. You're talking of free trade. Markets without frontiers is a reality already across the world. Harnessing the power of the human brain. This is what we have to do. If people have been able, I come from that uh, not so long ago. Um, we have built a city on the high waters, on the high seas. If that can happen, if we have turned, my friend, there is our thing, it comes from Abu Dhabi. If we have turned the desert, dry desert, into a miracle garden, and it's an attraction of the whole world, it incites curiosity. Why is it that we can't do things for us in Africa? Harness the power of our, the human brain. Forging ahead with a sense of tomorrow. This is what our children are expecting for us. Time for Africa. Free trade and 5G technology. A new generation of wireless network to improve lead time to start with. To improve on punctuality, security at airports, timely delivery. At times we also have some blockchain, artificial intelligence. But what? Sounds big. But this is exactly what's going to happen. You will improve on your lead time for trade. Punctuality, very important in business. Security at airports, timely delivery. Passenger information will become more accurate, transmitted on time. We know the mess at times in our airports in Africa, even in Mauritius. Significant impact of self driving vehicles, which will be safer and perhaps more autonomous. Improve business discipline. This is, this, this is the meaning of 5G technologies, the meaning of blockchain, the meaning of artificial intelligence. The future of aviation landscape in Africa. Rising Africa will depend heavily on aviation. We have the critical mass. 1.2 billion people. There is a market for aviation to be uh, to take another shape. The advent of low-cost carriers in Africa should be able to boost intra-Africa trade initiatives, passenger movements, and of course the role of international organizations like the World Bank, etc., should be able to incentivize free trade in the open sky of Africa. I put it to you perhaps as a take-home for the organizers. Why can't we create a permanent office for the single African air transport market that we, all, we have started in 2018? Set up a market. Do you know that OPEC, which has been influencing the oil industry for so many, many years, was created in 1960, in the Middle East mostly. But they started with only five members, just five members, and they influenced the oil sector for so many years, and still they can counteract the non-OPEC members. Five members, they didn't wait for all the countries to join them, and they remain determined in the process. Let us walk the talk, ladies and gentlemen, unlock the trade potentials Air travel is no more luxury for Africa, for anywhere in the world. It is the economic lifeline of Africa. This is no time to dream. This is no time to just think and intellectualize the problems. This is no time to recycle our own ideas, our own definitions of things. The best way to dream, in my view, is doing now. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. I'm really honored to be part of this discussion. And of course, as you have been told, is my minister for foreign affairs who was supposed to come, but due to other assignments, he could not make it. And he told me to come and uh, take the message and take it back home for further action and implementation. And true, I'm getting the right messages to take back to, to us. And first of all, I also want to really sincerely thank uh, Dinesh and the team that has organized this uh, workshop. Because I got in touch with them at a very short notice and they managed to facilitate me in 
in a most effective way I've never imagined. So thank you so much, and I'm sure there are so many people involved in the organization of this workshop that I need to thank, but I won't go into the details of mentioning all of them. Um, I was sitting there and then trying to imagine what am I supposed to announce, because this section is for major announcements. I'll tell you for sure I have no special announcement to make, but to say this is a very great opportunity for Mauritius, for Kenya, and for Africa, because I've been thinking we need to create big forums and small forums to popularize what we really treasure as the African continent of free trade area. We talk about this in summits, in very meetings, but in most cases we realize that people at the grassroots level, they do not have a lot of information on what the CFTA is, what it intends to achieve, and how they can be part and parcel of this process of ensuring that we grow intra-Africa trade. In fact, what I wanted to say it was summarized by Dine, and actually my biggest contribution it was said by me, but I'll repeat it, maybe from the beginning. The issue with Africa is we always think goods and services from outside Africa are better than what we have from within Africa. When we talk of the challenges that will face the full and fast implementation, of the CFTA. We always talk of finance, we always talk of infrastructure, we always talk of technology, but the issue of the mindset and the attitude towards made in Africa is something we really need to work on to really make the CFTA a real delivery for, for all of us. Of course, I know that uh, when we talk of the challenges, actually I've started my kind of contribution from the middle or from the end. I really want to appreciate what Mauritius is doing, in the sense that Mauritius, in our understanding, has um, is developing itself as a big financial center for Africa. I, and I see there's a number of Mauritian companies who are developing a lot of interest in Kenya and in Africa. Supporting other small businesses in Africa. I think we need this framework where not everybody thinks can do the same thing. We need to approach CFTA from the comparative and competitive advantage point of view. I think if Mauritius can do very well at the financial center of Africa, why can't another country take another specialty and another country take so that we don't all produce coffee, we don't all produce tea, we don't all make uh, curious items, but we have specialization that will make Africa grow and we shall all benefit in a bigger way than encouraging some competition that does not enhance growth and real development. But let me go back to where we, we are talking about the CFTA. Of course, we know that Kenya has been very keen on the journey of the CFTA. We pride ourselves as the, among the first countries to sign the CFTA agreement and the first country to ratify. And of course, most of you know that we were very keen to also host the Secretariat of the CFTA, but it is also good luck that can afford it. But what I want to say is, Kenya is fully committed to the full realization of the CFTA objectives. Kenya is placing itself, putting in place the necessary structures 
to benefit from and facilitate the African continent of free trade area. For those who are familiar with the developments we are, uh, we are undertaking back in Kenya, around three years ago, we launched a high-speed train from Mombasa to Nairobi. And it has now been extended from Nairobi to Naivasha, around 130 kilometers from Nairobi on the way towards, um, towards the western part of the country. The key benefit of the new standard gauge railway is to facilitate trade and free movement of people from the point of entry, which Mombasa, we call that in the entry point of all our merchandise. And for those of you who know, Mombasa serves the bigger part of Eastern and Central Africa in terms of their imports. So, if we can reduce the time taken for goods to move from Mombasa to Rwanda to Uganda to Congo, from three weeks to now, it's now I'm told it's now around one week, for a container from Mombasa to, to Rwanda, it can easily take a week and it's done, but before it is to take more than even three weeks. Moving from Mombasa to Nairobi, does now reduce the, the time from around 10 to 8 hours to now 3 to 4 hours. Recently, we launched our inland port of Kisumu, which has been redeveloped to serve better the, the Eastern Africa countries which are bordering the Lake Victoria. We know that to improve trade and free movement, within the East Africa, we need to develop these kinds of infrastructures. We have been upgrading the port of Mombasa to make it handle bigger ships, be more efficient. Under the Luxet, the Lamu port, South Sudan and Ethiopia transport corridor, we have built a new port in Lamu. And all the infrastructure, all connecting Kenya, South Sudan, and Ethiopia, which we hope this infrastructure will go beyond Ethiopia and connect both to the northern part of Africa and the central uh, and western part of Africa. I think in whatever little activities that we are doing, we hope all these infrastructures will, in a big way, contribute to opening up the intra-African market to grow business and trade within the continent. And of course, there's no doubt, everybody knows, the success of the CFTA is the success of the entirety of the African continent. Now, I was told to talk about um, building the links between Kenya and Mauritius in terms of trade. I cannot overemphasize the friendly and cordial relations that we have at official government to government level between Kenya and Mauritius. I've never heard of anything negative or demeaning between our two countries. And from my economic diplomacy point of view, the bilateral, good bilateral relations become the stepping stone for trade and investment between the two countries. So we have a framework within which we can work on Kenya and Mauritius to make things work, to contribute meaningfully to the African continent of free trade area and contribute to our to the development of our individual and collective countries. I remember last year, as Vine has mentioned, I was part of the delegation that accompanied his excellency president to Mauritius. And there are so many good things that I got from that visit. First, the Prime Minister of Mauritius and the President of Kenya committed themselves to strengthen trade and investment links, then it is up to us 
as practitioners both in government, in the private sector, to make sure that we use those proclamations by our leaders to make things work. We had one of the best business forums we have organized outside and inside our country. For those who attended the business forum here in, uh, in Port Louis, I think, it was uh, one of the most magnificent ones. And there were real outcomes from that. I remember our Kenya Private Sector Association signed an agreement, a memorandum of understanding with the Economic Development Board of Mauritius. <coughs> I remember we had some agreement between the Kenya Chamber of Commerce and Industry with their counterparts in Mauritius. What else do we need to really promote bilateral trade and investment? Those kind of frameworks, in my view, they provide the background and the foundation for growing business between our two countries. And of course, not to mention, this is one of the visits that I realized when we went back home, we had a lot of follow-up messages from our private sector. And I'm sure we have had a number of visits from Kenyan business people to Mauritius and from Mauritius to Kenya. Of course, I'm within the, the government office, but because of the nature of our work, we do connection between our private sector and the private sector in other countries, and so we come to know about what is happening. In fact, more interesting, I was talking to one of the business people yesterday, uh, before I left Nairobi. Okay, she's a founder. Then she told me she's setting up a private um, consultancy firm, and she has partners in the US and, uh, and in the UK. But when they were to do their first meeting, actually they decided Mauritius is the best place to meet. And so she has, she had to come to Mauritius. The partners had to come from UK and US, and they met in Mauritius. And that is it. I was asking, what is it that you could not meet in Nairobi? Because they understand that there is something special about Mauritius that businesses from outside Africa also appreciate. And actually it is about the financial aspect of the discussion of the work that they are doing. Why can't we grow Mauritius in this way? And we use Kenya as the gateway to the rest of Africa so that the narrative we have to grow in my view, when I'm in Kenya I say look east to Mauritius. And when you're in Mauritius, you say, look west to Kenya. Because you have a partner just across the waters. And if we build this narrative in the best way possible, I think we can achieve a lot. And finally, actually, as I wanted to, uh, to, to, to emphasize what my colleague, uh, the Ebersoc uh, representative, said, I'll take the message home and talk to the, the coordinator of the EcoSoc Kenya chapter to see how best we can carry forward this initiative of popularizing the CFTA within our localities and beyond. In my understanding, this is one of the missing links in the establishment of the CFTA. It is not about it's not about talking about it in the big summits and the big conferences. We need to bring it to the grassroots. And I believe when we work together, I think we shall all achieve. I thank you all. I think you say no. So uh, my my dear guest, um, please bear with me five minutes. I try to make it really very fast and. There are many things that has that have been said earlier, but you will see now. So we'll talk quickly about Business Books Africa. 
And this is a project that has been developed over a couple of years. I've been traveling to quite a number of countries across the continent. By now, I think I've covered 27 or 28 countries. So there is still a long way to go. And building roads, building air routes, etc. That's the way we can make it happen. But on my side, it's one thing, but for all of us in the world. So we all know, or most of us know this map. This map is one of the earliest where Mauritius was called uh, Dina Ali, where by a rat traders who are doing business in the Indian Ocean, and Mauritius was called for. It was said earlier. Uh, Mauritius has always been very strategic in doing business. Just like things have evolved, many things have changed in terms of connectivity, etc., etc. But if you recall how things were, at the very beginning, you can imagine that they were alone, and the first people coming to Mauritius could have been quite strange. But today, with the message from our friend Frederick and Dennis and all of the speakers, we understand it differently. And I just leave it to you to imagine how different it is, uh, and most importantly, in our advantage. So, Mauritius has always been a very important port of call for business development between Asia, Africa, Europe, and beyond. But the Indian Ocean and the East Coast of Africa, how are we connected? Okay? Getting to Africa is a big challenge. We have three direct links, South Africa, Madagascar, and Kenya. What about the rest if we come to civilization? Of course, we have other interconnectivities, but that's not enough. If we talk about maritime connectivities, again, it's another challenge. There was a slide that Mr. Hassan presented earlier about fiber connectivity, because we are in an age of information. Now, it's even beyond. We are talking about artificial intelligence. So it's moving very fast and far beyond. So all these brings me to this slide, which is very, very important. So this one is about what China's doing, and we have uh, earlier, I've seen in the audience some, some delegates from, I think, uh, China's diplomacy and, and economic affairs. If China is able to do that for its own country, which is massive, and going beyond Asia to Africa, to Europe, etc., what about Africa? And what Mauritius can bring to this is the question. So literally, there are all trends. Many among you have been stating about the connectivity in terms of roads. Frederick just mentioned about the port, just mentioned about the train connection between Mombasa to Nairobi. And then, how to build this? We need exploitators, we need builders, we need suppliers, we need all these. But there are realities. Mauritius, it's what it is in terms of scale, but the continent is gigantic. We are speaking about 400 million of investment in the construction sector. Roads, dams, whatever we call it, that's one thing. And it is an average uh, growth of 7.7% uh, yearly, and this is the current uh, trend. Okay? And it's even, uh, I would say, we are having exponential growth in that level. Uh, we need professionals, like I've said earlier. We need more. I can speak a lot of that because I'm an architect and I'm directly we need to it. And also in terms of planning, strategy, development, etc. Just imagine having uh, to deliver 50,000 housing units every single day. How to build that? Who will build that? Where to get the materials, etc. It means a lot of things. So we have to join our hands together to get this done. And this is something which is directly linked to the reality of Africa. We need that. We need schools, we need healthcare facilities on a daily basis. Just imagine five hospitals we need every day. How do we do that? We need investment. Richard spoke about the investment earlier, etc. So we need the good governance also because we are receiving funds amongst others, etc. etc. So just to get it short, to come to one thing in terms of, of, of proportions. If I just stick to my professional uh, hat and what is happening, just look at the number of architects that we have in the continent for the number of inhabitants or Africans. Okay? It's one architect for every 17,000 Africans currently. And look at what we have in Italy. We have one architect for every 400 Italians. 
That's just crazy figures. These are real figures. So, but just to keep on pushing, we've been talking a lot about connecting Africa to Africa. Africans are contributing to that process. And how are we making it? There is a tool. Today, our office is nearly this. Everything comes from that. Ten years ago, there was one invention, iCal. Before that, we had the MPSA. How many amongst you heard about the MPSA? Okay. So Africa has invented, literally, the digital money. And it has now become something quite worldwide. And uh, our, one of our speakers uh, spoke about smart contracts and how to transfer money and this and that. So in the, uh, I would say information highway and financial highway. So literally, there is a project that is coming forward, which is meant to target the grassroots, which means it's going to, to take from the top, I would say industry captains, big companies, till going to that farmer in a remote rural area of Africa, that from his or her smartphone can do business. This is one way of connecting. There are many others, and this one is really getting a reality, and it will be uh, accessible to, to, to anyone like I said. So I'm uh, pleased to just showcase the logo of Business Boost Africa. The, the nickname is Gizmo. Okay, so uh, Africa will like those kind of nicknames. So that's how it will be. And uh, the app is under the, the process to be made public. But I have reserved it not to launch it in Mauritius for a simple reason. I have to be in another African country to say that this is the way we want to share. And that will be happening quite soon. And we are going to see it to Nairobi. And that should be by latest June 2020. And I'm sure my good friend Frederick and Dennis and Vina and all the rest will be part of that because it's going to be one of the smallest, tiniest tool, but that can bring a great change. So you can understand why that will work because we can interconnect as many as we want to infinity and covering the whole of Africa. So that will be coming soon on your smartphones and you will be amazed by what we can do as smartphones. So I want a symbol, I'll keep that secret to be launched in Nairobi because I want those who are interested to do business in Africa, East East, in a way, to start. We need to start with small steps. We will do it. This brings me to another thing. The official launch of the Kenya Mauritius Business Association is also getting or becoming a reality. It was supposed to be not here. We were expecting the cabinet secretary, but uh, it's not that I don't appreciate my good friend Frederick, but I truly want you to be part of the process to make it happen in your country, in your capital city, once again. So, Kemuka is also coming. That's another nickname. We like it, that's the way it is. And do you want to know my nickname? My parents are here, but it's fine. I will tell you later on. It may be part of it in a hidden form. But whatever it is, this is the logo of the Kenya Mauritius Business Association. It's a dodo. It is a Maasai dodo. Can you imagine what it means? And you see the peers. It's rough.